Hello, um, I, I feel exhausted just listening to that. That's <laughs> like the last 10 years of my life compressed down into 30 seconds. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Trisha. I am a developer advocate for JetBrains. Um, what that means is that um, my, what I, my, what my job is is to try and persuade you to use IntelliJ IDEA, but what I really like to do is figure out what's new in Java, what's useful for us as Java developers, and how maybe we're going to use that in the real world. If I happen to demonstrate some IntelliJ IDEA features along the way, then that's just a benefit as far as my employer is concerned. So what I've done to put this talk together is I've spent the last few years since I've started working for JetBrains just constantly staying up to date with what's coming in Java. Um, and what I wanted to do is give the sort of TLDR version of that for most developers because it's almost impossible to stay on top of all the changes. Um, as was mentioned, I know there was another talk on a similar-ish topic, um, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Uh, I think there will be a little bit of overlap, but since I think Sander covered more on modularity, when, which I don't intend to cover at all, then I think we're probably, we're probably fine. Okay, so let's quick, let's, get, let's just jump straight in. Um, upgrading from Java 8 sounds scary, and I don't want to have to pay for Java. This is the sort of premise of where we're, we're coming from here. Who, who is aware of the fact that maybe we might have to pay for Java from now on? Oh, that's good. I'm glad that there's some people who know that. For the rest of you who didn't know that, we may have to pay for Java from now on if you're not aware of all the ins and outs, which I'm going to try and cover. So um, actually, I'm super happy with Java 8, thanks. I think I'll just stick with it. I did a super um, scientific poll on Twitter because, you know, Twitter is where I do my work these days because I'm a developer advocate. And uh, I asked which version of Java people were using. The majority of people were using Java 8, mostly because I couldn't fit Java 6 and 7 on here either. Um, a lot of, there's a whole bunch of people, well, there's some people using 11, which surprised me, uh, and a few using 9 and 10. A quick poll of the room, who is using Java 8? Great, you're the perfect audience. Who's using Java 9? Uh, 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 not sure, OK. Uh, who's using Java 10? <laughs> who's using Java 11? Great, that's really good. Who's using Java 12? I am surprised. Who's using a version earlier than 8? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're the right audience for this talk. I'm really sorry. <laughs> You've got to get on 8 first, OK? Um, are you Android developers by any chance? Use Kotlin. Um, anyway, uh, so the, the, um, the spread of people using the different versions might come as a bit of a surprise to people if they haven't stayed up to date with what's happening with the release cadence of Java. Why would there be a whole bunch of people on 8, almost no one on 9 and 10, and a bunch of people on 11? So let's take a look at the ins and outs of this. Since Java 8, the whole process, the whole political side of uh, releases, updates, licensing, and support has changed, specifically since Java 11, actually, which is the important point. Well, OK, Java 9 for the release cadence, Java 11 for, the, um, for licensing and support. So since Java 9, we've been having releases of Java every six months. This is like a massive shock to us in the Java ecosystem because we used to get them every three years if we were lucky. And now we're getting them every six months. And uh, me as a Java developer, I'm like, what? Hey, I can't keep up with this. This is just constantly changing. But they are small releases every six months instead of these big bang releases. Now, obviously, Oracle don't really, in the past, they would have supported a version of Java for like three years or so until the next version comes out. They don't want to support every version of Java for, like, for three years, because at some point in the near future, they're going to be supporting like seven different versions of Java. And if you've ever had to support more than one version of your application, you know that that's an absolute nightmare. And they don't want to do that. So instead, each of these releases is going to have a lifespan of approximately six months uh, until the next release, except for designated long-term support releases. So Java 8 is a long-term support release and will be supported-ish uh, for a, a, a period of time. Java 11 is the current long-term support release. So if you're the sort of enterprise that wants to upgrade your version of Java only every three years, you should be looking at upgrading to Java 11, not any of the other versions. And then in another three years' time, Java 17 probably will be the next long-term support release. The current version of Java is Java 12. So what it means is you could upgrade to Java 12 if you want, but that will be replaced by Java 13 in September. So really, we're looking at the choice of probably from Java 8 going to Java 11. 
So we have two types of releases. We have these interim releases, these short-term six-month releases, and we have these bigger long-term support releases. But it's really important to understand that this is the Oracle story. This is for the Oracle JDK. Now, most of us have been downloading the Oracle JDK by default for many, many years and not really thinking about it because they're the people who are kind of the stewards of Java and the sort of de facto people to go to for our JDK. We generally went somewhere else only if we wanted something specific. But, um, but there are plenty of other vendors out there. But since Oracle is the default that we generally tend to go towards, it's important to understand how they've changed, um, how they've changed all these things because it's going to impact us as developers. Particularly, starting with Java 11, Oracle will provide JDK releases under an open source license and a commercial license, which is going to replace the, original, the old BCL license, which used to combine both free and commercial support. So they now have two different licenses, and it replaces the old license. That sounds frightening and overly complicated. Please talk us through this. Uh, in case you don't have small children, this quote is from the Lego Batman movie, which I have seen many, many, many times. <sighs> Basically, the short version of this particular change from the Oracle um, camp is that now there are two different um, things, two different JDKs that you could download. There is the uh, Open JDK, Oracle Open JDK build, and there is Oracle's commercial build. The, um, and since Java 11, the commercial build is fundamentally the same as the Open JDK build. In the past, the Open JDK build was missing commercial features like flight recorder and a bunch of other things, mission control, flight recorder, things like that. And since Java 11, they are all available in Open JDK. So all the features that we expect to see in Oracle's commercial JDK are available in any build of Open JDK. So, OK, then why do we have two different builds with two different licenses? Well, the licensing is the important thing. We have two builds which fundamentally do the same kind of thing, but they are licensed in two different ways. Oracle's OpenJDK is free from a financial point of view and also has an, uh, an open source license, but it will be replaced every six months. So if you want to use the Open JDK build, you have to upgrade every six months because there will be no updates beyond the next, beyond the six-month lifespan of that release. Okay, so if you want the free Oracle one, you have to upgrade every six months. The Oracle commercial JDK is the one that has long-term support. So if you want to get the updates for the for the next three years for the long-term support. Uh, version, you have to pay for the commercial one if you want to use it in production. It's free in development and testing and all those environments. If you use it in production, you have to pay. So it is true that under certain circumstances, if you're using the Oracle Commercial J JDK and put it into production, you will have to pay. Okay. Now, what I talked about was the fact that we are uh, the Oracle JDK build is now the same as the Open JDK build. And fortunately, there are many, many builds of OpenJDK. So you don't just have the option of using Oracle's JDK, Oracle's OpenJDK, and replace it every six months. There are loads of other vendors, many of whom offer support for longer than six months. Okay? If in doubt, a good place to start looking is Adopt OpenJDK, which is a community-run effort. And this is where you can get builds for um, a bunch of different versions, for a bunch of different platforms. And they provide support. So it says, we will provide long-term support releases for at least four years. So you can see that Java 8 is supported until at least September 2023, Java 11 until September 2022. That makes no sense to me, but OK, fine. <laughs> and they will be providing releases for um, Java 12 and, and each six monthly um, thing too. Now, this sounds super complicated, but the short version is, a, don't download Oracle's commercial JDK and put it in production because you will have to pay. And B, you have a lot more choice now. It's, it's a good thing, but it does mean that someone in your organization needs to do some research on this licensing and on, for example, how often you want to upgrade and make an informed decision about which JDK you want to use from which vendor and how frequently you want to update it. Okay? Everyone looks a little bit scared. <laughs> 
So it does beg the question, why bother? That sounds like an awful lot of effort. And as I said, super happy with Java 8, thank you. I don't really see why I'm going to have to jump through all of these hoops. So let's look first at language features, because I'm a developer, and that's what I care about. So once again, I asked, I'm so sorry for people taking photos of the slides, because I'm just going to basically flick through faster than you can take a photo. <laughs> the slides will be available online, or are available already. Language features. I did, once again, a super scientific poll by asking Twitter, uh, for those of you who are using beyond Java 8, which features do you use the most? Which features do you like? So we got um, a bunch of people saying that they like using JShell. Uh, JShell, JShell. Um, and JShell is the REPL. Uh, who knows what a REPL is? A few, most of you. Uh, who's used a REPL before? More or less the same people. So let's just do a quick demo of the REPL. Um, to me, I, I kind of, when I heard about this, I was like, I don't really understand. Oh, I don't have a thing for the REPL. Um, I don't really understand why I need a REPL for Java, because, um, because it's Java. You have a lot of ceremony. A REPL seems like something that we wouldn't really use. Let's try and what should we use? I don't have my, where are my shortcuts? Right, J shell. Ah, I don't have it on this computer. OK, so which operating system am I using? Java 11 home, Java 11 home, J shell. Oh, I hate you so much. I really, you know. Why hasn't Windows fixed this problem? Fine, be like that. Right, let's open it inside here instead, because IntelliJ idea. Let's see if I can get it to work inside here first. <laughs> oh, I hate you so much. I practice every other part of this talk except for this bit, because this bit is usually really easy. All right, yes, easy, easy, that's what we want. Uh, let's go here then, fine. CD, where are we? Go into bin, see what's there. Thank you. See, what's wrong with you? I've been using the Mac all week, that's my excuse, and I can't remember how to Windows. Right, so I'm in the REPL. As you can see, I'm running this outside of my IDE, so I can run this independently of whichever version my, of Java my application is running on. So I can play with a REPL independent of everything else, which is a good way to get started with new features of Java. Um, right, so what can I do? I can say system.out. Look, I get tab completion inside the REPL. Print line. And I'm used to using an IDE, so this is what I want to see. Uh, hello. Yay. <laughs> Note that we don't have to have a class file. We don't have to say public static void main. We don't have to do any of this ceremony. Also note, no semicolon. Oh my goodness, Java has come so far. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it's almost JavaScript. How dare you? <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so we can quickly sketch things out. We can do things like I can obviously I can define a variable uh, int uh, thing equals three. Great, I've got something called thing. I can play around with new features like uh, var, which we'll look at in a minute. Var something equals five. OK, I can uh, create anonymous variables. So I can just say, right, there's a number there, and it's just going to assign it to, to $4. Uh, I can also have a look at all my var variables, variables, variables by typing vars, and it will list all of them there. I can define a method. Let's see if I can create. Uh, Let's do void uh, print something. Uh, system. So I can create myself a method. And this one specifically tells me, right, you've done this, it's fine, um, but I can't use it because it's got a forward reference. So until you define some val, I can't, I can't use it. But I could try. I could say, do you have print something? And it goes, yes, but you can't do that yet. So then I'm going to say var some val equals a thing. Did I say it was a? Oh, I didn't say what type it was. Ta-da! OK, so you can see I can sort of incrementally build up some stuff to play with. I've been using this a lot to figure out what uh, different collection types are available, what I can do with particular types of collections, since some of that changed in, in Java 9 and 10. Uh, what else can I do? So I've got a bunch of commands, like I can run methods. I can run, I'm going to say help, yes. 
help. Um, and I can also, I can save my history into a file. I can also load a file and run a file. So I can kind of use it for scripting if I want to. I'm not sure Java would be my first language of choice for scripting, but it is possible to do that now um, with, with JShell, for example. Um, I've mostly been using it to play around with new language features. I've also been using it to um, demonstrate features in, um, when I'm trying to show how to use things outside the IDE. I mean, that's not great, because I'm supposed to be telling people how to use the IDE, but uh, it's fine. Speaking of the IDE, we do have a tool inside here, which is uh, the JShell console. And you could do something similar inside IntelliJ IDEA. I better, yeah, let me get tab completion, and we can say fine, and I can just do all the stuff I expect to do inside my IDE, uh, something. It works a bit like the Groovy console, if you've ever used the, the Groovy console, uh, except the control enter didn't work. Oh, yes, it does, fine. So yeah, so you can do it inside the IDE as well, and you can use, you can then pick your different JRE, pick the different class paths you want to use and refer to some of your own um, code and run it. So that's quite cute. Um, a lot of people using JShell and quite pleased with, with what it gives them in terms of being able to play around with some of these new language features. Is it going to give me some value? Or maybe even testing certain stuff without having to go through the whole ceremony of creating a test or a new um, class or something. Another feature people are very excited about is these three little letters var. So everyone likes VAR. I think VAR is great, it's amazing, we love VAR. Um, but I also had to put this in here because, you know, VAR gets me something like Kotlin. So I'm like a hardcore Java person. I've been doing Java for ages, but I do work for JetBrains. We did invent Kotlin, so every now and again, I do have to say, Kotlin's quite good, you should try it out. Uh, but I, I'm more of a Java person. Uh, so let's have a look at VAR. I specifically, so I believe the other talk talked a little bit about VAR. I kind of want to look at when you might not use VAR. For, well, when you may or may not use it. So var is local variable type inference. So it's local variable, so you can't use it on fields. I can't turn this into a var. Um, that's not going to work. And you can't use it on uh, parameters, because on a parameter, you're not going to know what type that is. Okay? So it's only for local variables. Let's undo those. And I've got IntelliJ to highlight places where I could use it if I want to. So I can use it. I can use it on local variables, specifically inside methods. Um, note, for those of you who've used other languages, there is only var. There is not var and val. There is var and final var. You can ask me at the end if you want to why that is, but that's the compromise that has been taken to anger the least people possible. And so, yes, yeah, so this is where we use it. Um, note that var is not dynamic typing. Var is um, it's syntactic sugar to hide a whole bunch of declaration of type, but it still has type. So if I hover over this, it tells me that it's still um, a list of, ty of type E in this case, but a list of strings. And I can use quick definition, I think. And it tells me, look, it's a final list of people. So it's not, it's not the same as like def or something. I'm not sticking it into an object. It's still typed. I just didn't have to physically type out that type, which means that you can't necessarily use it in all places. For example, oh, I don't have an example there. Um, if you have, um, oh, down here, here, if I'm declaring a new array list and I don't put the type inside there, then I can't just turn that straight into a a var, because I've just actually changed the type. This is now an array list of objects, not an array list of strings, because I have to put the type information somewhere. Uh, I believe IntelliJ will actually do that conversion for me. So yeah, it's just move the string over here so that you're still going to get the same type. But you have to declare that type somewhere. You can't just remove all the type information. The, the compiler's smart, but it's, it's not that smart. Uh, so you can use it there. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the best practices. There's a, there's a document which covers those best practices here. The point of VAR is to try and improve the readability of your code. It is not to try and make it worse. So if, for example, you already had, and I know that occasionally we do this, a variable name which isn't super useful and a method name which isn't super useful, and then we put that as VAR, we, when we're reading this code, we have no idea what this is. We have no idea what the types are, and we obviously the IDE will tell us what we can do with it if we want to. But let's say we're trying to debug this, um, this code in production or something, when we're reading the code, we won't know what it's supposed to be. So sure, you can, you can make it into a var if you want to, but it's, it's not aiding the readability of the code at this point. You might want to use 
for when you've got enough information over here on the right-hand side about what it is. So here we might want to use var because, look, we've already said new buffered reader, so we don't, we don't need to say that's a buffered reader. That's fine. But if, like, again, if you don't have the right information over here and you turn this into a var, then, uh, then it becomes completely meaningless. It's also useful for, for if you've got long stream operations and you want to break them up to just kind of have an intermediate step to maybe give it a variable name to, to make it sensible. Uh, let's see. Let's do this. Let's turn this into a variable. Let's call it entries. So some of these intermediate stream operations have some very interesting types. But really, you don't really care, because the next thing you're going to do is just call stream on it anyway. So this is a good place to use uh, var, for example. Um, and another place is when you're iterating over stuff. This is genuine code I found from somewhere where we have some really interesting generics. But I don't really care, because what I'm doing is I've got an iterator. I'm iterating over it and then doing something else. So I could actually just say, I don't really care about any of that. Um, that could just be a var. And then this could be var as well. I don't really care about that. And then my code becomes much easier to read. Because in this case, the types don't really matter. I know that I'm iterating over something. I have some sort of entry. And then I do something with it. So who cares what the types are? So yes, so var is not a magic catch-all to make everything better. But it can help reduce the, the boilerplate in our code. It can aid readability. But don't apply it everywhere, because then your code base might end up being a little bit too terse. And that's not really, that's not really the Java way. My favorite feature from a recent version of Java, it came in in Java 9, so obviously you have access to it from Java 10, 11, 12, and 13 as well, is convenience factory methods for collections. And a bunch of people really love this. It's all good. Everyone likes convenience factory methods. Um, I'll show you what this means. It's, it's something really simple, um, but it's something that makes life a lot easier. Let's look at Java 9. In the olden days, or in your case now, um, you have to create a list like this, arrays.asList, if you've got a set of values you want to poke into a list. And that's kind of fine. You can't add values to that list. It's all right. It's sort of immutable. But it's not immutable at all, because you can change those values inside that list. If you want an immutable list with a prepared set of values, you need to put it inside an unmodifiable list, which many of us don't, because honestly, who needs all this boilerplate around there, particularly if it's test code or something like that? In, um, in Java 9, you just turn that into a list of, and then you get an immutable list. So that's nice. It's shorter syntax, slightly shorter than saying arrays.asList anyway, and it's immutable. More interestingly, it applies to set. And set was a bit difficult, because to create a set, you have to create a list, and then create a set, and then put it inside an unmodifiable set. Because obviously, previously, the language developers of Java hated us and thought that we never wanted to create sets ever. But now, you can just do set.of. That's much better. So now there's no excuse for using the wrong data type inside your, um, inside your code. It's very easy to use lists, but they're not always the right choice. If you have a map and you want to initialize it with a set of values, it was always a little bit hacky, I felt, in Java, where you have to use, you perhaps use a static initializer or something. Um, now you can use, if you want to, you can use map.ofEntries. It's, uh, it's not the prettiest, but it's a little bit better. Let's static import that. So I'm going to say map to of entries and create the entries of key value pairs. If you have a much smaller map with a smaller set of values, there's a convenience method which will make your life a lot easier. Let's get rid of these. If you've got less, fewer than 10, you can say map to of and do key value, key value, key value. And that's kind of fine. It can be a little bit risky, potentially, if your key and value have the same type, because you have to make sure you've matched them up properly and you don't accidentally put the key in the value or whatever. But it's, um, it's a good convenience method. This would have been really helpful when I worked at MongoDB, because I did a lot of putting data into maps to put into a document database. This is a much easier way of working. And that's, that's actually one of my favorite uh, features from a recent version of Java, because it just, it's just a lot easier to, to work with collections. And that's what we spend a lot of time doing. Um, since Java 10, you can actually collect to unmodifiable collections as well. So instead of just doing collectors.toList, you can say collectors.toUnmodifiableList. 
Uh, and IntelliJ will also scan your code and go, oh, these places where you're using two list, you can use two unmodifiable list instead. So you can start using more safely. You can use the unmodifiable lists and not accidentally have mutation in your code if you don't want it there. There are some new methods on the stream API. These came in in Java 9. Um, take while and drop while. It's a kind of useful thing that was missing from the Java 8 streams, where you can say, like, do some operation on this stream until some criteria is met, and then stop. There was no way of doing that before. Or the opposite, which is drop while. So ignore the stream until some criteria is met, and then start processing the stream. It's, it's super useful for those specific cases where you need that kind of thing. I found it useful for when I am perhaps processing a file, and then I've, I've reached the limit of where I want to process that file, whatever that is, maybe some external dependency, then I can just cut off and just say, right, no more. Let's just finish the stream there. Java 11, we got predicate.not, which seems kind of, there was a bit of argument over this, like what, what do we need predicate.not for? We have an exclamation mark for that. There is absolutely zero need for predicate.not. So um, I went away and decided to look at a code example which would work for this. Java 11. Um, oh, well, that's the, that's the new example. So what you do now, for example, is you say, if you've got a filter and you say it does not meet some criteria, obviously you can put your exclamation mark in there and use a lambda expression. But some people particularly would like to work with uh, method references for whatever reason, and you can't turn this into something which uses a method reference. I mean, obviously you could actually just extract that to a method and say, and then turn it into a method reference, but that's a bit silly. Well, it's not silly, slightly overkill. So instead, you can use predicate.not. And you could say, let's static import that. So then you can use your um, method reference if you want to. Again, this is just a case of providing some extra tools for developers who, who want to improve the re readability of their code. And it's based on what you consider to be readable or not. So if you don't like it, don't use it. But for some, some people who really want to do this, they could not do it before, and now they can. Um, and then over the course of 9, 10, and 11, we've been getting additional methods on optional, which I personally have found really helpful. I really liked the idea of optional in Java 8. I like the idea, especially because I've worked on code bases where you have to do null checks everywhere. And I'm like, is this really valid that it could be null or not? I, I just don't really know. I liked the idea of having a type which would say, this might be null or it might not be, and then force you to do that check. What I did find, though, with Java 8 is that the checks, the, the way of working with it in a functional way, with lambdas, et cetera, was a little bit limited. If you could work with the simple um, if present uh, syntax, then that's fine. But if you have more complicated cases, then you ended up still having these if statements anyway, and you're like, well, I could have used a null, and I would have had far fewer code. But in Java, in the latest versions of Java, this has become a lot simpler. Let's have a look at optional. So in Java 8, you might get an optional, and then you might have a case where you want to do an if or an else. And you can't, you have to do the is present and do a get, or you do an else in Java 8. And I was like, mm, this doesn't seem really the optional way of doing stuff. In Java, in later versions of Java, you can use if present or else, and then you pass in two lambda expressions. So now it's a much more functional way of doing stuff. It's, it's fewer lines of code too, but it just looks a lot less ugly than the if statement. You can use or, which is a way of returning. You can say, return this optional or return another optional. So you don't have to unwrap the optionals and do stuff with them. You can just actually work with two optionals in their wrappers. Um, you can use uh, optional.stream to simplify uh, methods inside uh, inside stream operations. So I've just, there's kind of limited use cases for this, but when you do stumble ac across this use case, it does make things a lot easier. You don't have to keep unpacking the optionals. It's just uh, the stream method will sort of do that for you. And um, you've got or else throw. So you can say this, uh, if you, again, this is useful if you're refactoring a code base which does null checks towards something which uses optionals. Sometimes you might want just a simple or else throw. So if it's null, just throw an exception. I want to see it. I want my tests to catch it. And then I might do some refactoring around that. And that would just literally do what you already were checking, probably, like check for the null and throw, um, throw the no such uh, value if it's, if it's null. 
Uh, in Java 11, they also added, this is another one of those like silly, not silly arguments, those arguments that people get very uh, worked up about that seem over something tiny. In Java 11, they added uh, is empty as the opposite of is present. And there was a lot of argument of, if you've got is present, I don't need is empty, I can just put a not in front of it. But again, it's about readability, because humans are not very good at parsing nots. So if you actually just say, if you're looking for the empty case, it's better to read if is empty than if is not present. The human brain doesn't parse that very well. So, um, and IntelliJ IDEA will allow you to play around with this too. So I can actually flip this. So I can invert is present to is empty, and it will flip everything around, and I can go, oh, it's easier to read, or it's not. Uh, and I can also do, let's see, I can do not, and that will, that will invert it too. Um, and then in this case, I, I can also, it will also suggest, if I, if I was using code which says not is present, it will automatically say, why don't you just say is empty instead? So it's a bit more, potentially a bit more readable. Again, personal choice. Uh, 14 minutes left. Uh, OK, hmm. We're nearly there with the features. We'll just have to skim through all the summary stuff. Fine, optional. Um, Java 11 has a built-in HTTP client which supports, uh, let's see, what does it say? It, uh, Proper non-blocking reactive stream support, HTTP 1.1 and 2. It's got everything we need. So this is very useful for people who are using HTTP, HTTP clients, especially for things like testing and stuff like that. It's all built into the language. We don't have to use an external dependency. Uh, I don't have a demo of that, so, um, so there's plenty of documentation on that, and I've linked to it from the page, which I'll have a link at the end of the talk. Uh, non-blocking reactive streams. Um, Multi-release jar files. In Java 9, since Java 9, library developers can package up a single jar which will be aware of whether it's running on Java 9, 10, 11, or earlier than 9. And that will allow you to, that will allow that jar file to make use of more recent um, features if they're available, or it will default to something uh, earlier if it's not available. Super useful for, for, li for, lang for library developers. And super useful for us, because if we're using a library like JUnit 5, we just download the one jar file and just know it's going to do the right thing regardless. I don't have to download the Java 8 version versus the Java 10 version or whatever. And of course, Java 9 had Jigsaw, which everyone was talking about. It's going to break the world. We're not supposed to call it Jigsaw anymore. We're supposed to call it the Java module system. Um, and actually, people are finding it quite useful. So again, uh, modularity can be useful for um, library developers and for um, some enterprises who might want to use it as a sort of excuse to either refactor them, set their code towards a more modular system, or um, to formalize a modular system they already had. I don't want to go on too much about modularity because uh, it was like the big ticket item of Java 9, and I'm really not certain that a lot of people are, are going to, they're certainly not going to backport their enterprise applications to modularity. I really don't think that there's a massive demand for that. And you don't have to. You can run on, on a later version of Java without using Jigsaw, modularity, any of that stuff. It's fine. You can just ignore it if you want to. But Jigsaw did allow us to have these interesting new tools like JLink. So JLink allows you to pick just the modules in Java, the language that you use, and bundle them together with your application and deploy it. So your deployable can potentially become a lot smaller. You don't have to deploy all of the JVA, all of the JDK, and my application and everything. I can just pick the bits of the JDK that I want, bundle it all together in my single, um, in my single zip file or jar file, and put it into the cloud, for example. Um, I do, let's see, I've, I've got a really quick demo of this. <laughs> I spent so long talking about features, I was, got so excited. So anyway, so um, it's a quick demo that you can't necessarily see because it's all here. But I'm going to call JLink, you give it a magic incantation of module paths and stuff. This is a multi-module um, project, and I'm going to package up everything into a single directory called 3Image. Uh, so I'll do that. Go into three image. Let's see what's there. So I've got a bin and a lib. Let's see what's in bin. And bin has got Java, the, the Java executables that I need. What else have I got? I also have um, JLink. Uh,
Note that I'm using the Java version that's inside my image. I'm not using an external thing on Java Home. I'm using this, this packaged up version of Java. I can say list modules, and it will show me uh, that it doesn't work. Uh, all right, normally that works really well. List module, list of modules. Well, that's a great error, isn't it? Hmm, I think I might feed that back to the team. Okay, so then the modules it uses are, so now the JDK is modularized. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different modules. Java.base is there all the time, and I'm also using Java.logging. Um, I'm not using anything else. I'm not using any of the rest of the JDK. These are the only modules I'm using, and these are my own modules from my own application, and that's all that's available in here. And if I look at my size, then I have a directory which is only 40 meg, and that includes Java. So you can see how this is going to be obviously faster to upload, faster to move around, save you loads of money in terms of space and stuff like that. So this is definitely a really interesting and good thing for, for Java the language. And this is one of the major benefits of modularity and modularizing the JDK. You don't have to necessarily modularize your application to reap some of the benefits of the fact that the JDK was modularized. All right, nine minutes and three seconds. Fine, it's below the time. All we have to do is go over the business benefits of Java 12. Oh, yeah, and switch expressions. Oh, my goodness, switch expressions. Uh, this is the last uh, Java feature I'm going to look at. Java, so this came in in Java 12. This is a preview feature. A preview feature means that this, and preview features are new since we moved to a six monthly release cadence two. So preview feature means that if you flip a particular flag, you can access new preview features and play with them and give feedback. But don't probably put them in production because they might change before they become solid, proper features. So um, switch expressions is a preview feature. This is a kind of typical switch statement. Uh, I can turn this into a switch expression, which is significantly fewer lines of code, uses lambda expressions, it's a bit prettier, it's quite nice. The switch can actually returns a value which I, I can assign to this. Um, one thing has changed in here. Uh, so this is the Java 12 version. Um, let's see. So I can actually, uh, what have I got here? So if I do something more complicated, for example, I have a lambda expression here. Um, I, in Java 12, I use the break keyword to return this value back into type. In Java 13, this will be, I believe, this will be yield instead. And, and that's why you don't want to use uh, preview features in production, because they will change probably in the next uh, release cycle. But it's totally worth playing with them and feeding back to the language developers. In fact, because this was a preview feature, developers could say, we didn't like using break. It was not a useful thing for us. Can you do something else? And they can actually change the language before it's too late. OK, and in the future, the good thing about doing this six monthly release cadence is that we can be constantly releasing new features. And some of the things we've got, oh, I didn't mention, Java 13 is going to have the updated uh, switch expressions. Java 13 is also going to have text blocks, which, um, which I will not be able to demo because I don't have Java 13 yet. But text blocks allows you to put nice, it's a nice way of putting in things like SQL or JSON or, you know, those kind of big, heavy, texty things that you have to put inside a string, there's a new syntax to allow us to do that without having to escape everything. It's going to be way better. Um, and in the future, we'll have things like lambda leftovers, which allows us to use um, un underscore for unused lambda parameters. Um, and data classes for Java will be interesting, and a bunch of stuff around performance and um, small enhancements to make the, the language easier to use. Now. The business doesn't care about language features. We cannot sell them on moving to Java 11 because we want to use switch expressions. I mean, honestly, there's just no, they don't care, um, which is fine. They're not supposed to care about that. What they do care about is things like performance. So generally speaking, a more recent version of the JDK will perform faster without having to do anything to it. You won't have to like tweak any weird things in order to get better performance. This is generally the case. Um, there are uh, improvements to the JVM, to how things are optimized. There's um, always yeah, runtime, optimi runtime optimizations. There's things like being able to make use of new CPU instructions if they're available. That kind of thing all happens under the covers. We don't see it, but our applications benefit from it if we move to a recent version of Java. 
We also get better memory usage, for example. Um, we have compact strings in more recent versions of Java, and that can significantly decrease the amount of memory that your application is using. Again, very important if we're running in the cloud or something like that, where memory will actually cost us if we're using too much of it. Uh, garbage collectors, people are always talking about the garbage collector when they talk about Java performance. I kind of dislike that because I don't think the garbage collector is responsible for all the ills in the Java performance world. But um, there are plenty of new garbage collectors uh, in more recent versions of Java. Java 9 changed the default garbage collector to G1 from, uh, I can't remember, um, anyway to G1, which is supposed to perform better. Uh, Java 10 has improved G1, and Java 11 has um, an experimental GC called Epsilon and an experimental GC called ZGC. And Java 12 has another experimental GC called Shenandoah and more improvements to G1 and to ZGC. So that seems like an awful lot of garbage collection changes. Um, and like, why multiple garbage collectors? Well, they all have different types of profiles designed to work on different types of applications. So instead of spending forever like purposefully tuning one particular garbage collector to your use case, pick the right garbage collector for your use case. So again, business reasons. Why would we want to move to a later version of Java? Well, cost. It will cost us less if we are, for example, running in the cloud and using less memory, deploying these smaller deployables, and, um, and getting better performance from our application. So this will cost us less money. But there's also other costs, like if we don't move to a more recent version of Java, um, our Java developers might decide not to work here anymore. And we might find it more difficult to attract good, well, not good developers, but more developers to come and work with us if our code base is going to start to gradually become older and older. So there's all sorts of opportunity costs as well as actual physical money costs, too. Um, there's also another benefit. We probably want to get on this six-monthly release uh, train like now before it gets away from us. There will be a bit of a hump getting over the big Java 9 um, update, but then once we're on this six-monthly release chain, we should be able to just keep updating every six months, at least in CI, somewhere like that, somewhere where we're automatically testing it. We might not want to deploy it to production every six months, but we should be able to test on the latest version somewhere. Because if it hurts, do it more frequently and bring the pain forward. We really don't want to be waiting for Java 17 to get over that hump of Java 9 and then um, you know, six years' worth of updates. It's just going to be enormously painful. Let's do it now. Let's just get it over and done with. And then let's do it more frequently so it no longer hurts as much. Does someone say pain? <laughs> Doesn't sound very good. What are the potential pain points for upgrading? A lot of people are a bit worried about modularity as a pain point. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to need to use modularity. There are some pain points around moving to a later version of Java due to the modularity things. But a lot of that has been patched over and fixed by things like your build tools and the libraries. So as long as you uh, kind of update your tools, the tools that you use, you probably won't feel the pain that you might have heard about a couple of years ago when people were complaining about Java 9. There is a possibility that if you're using Java 11, you will find missing classes and missing methods. Deprecated means deprecated now. Things are going away. Things were removed from the JDK. So um, JavaFX is no longer there anymore. Corba is no longer there anymore. Java X stuff, so Java EE packages that were in the JDK are no longer there anymore. So if you upgrade, these things will disappear. Of course, you can still get them. You just add them as an external dependency. So it's not the end of the world, but it is something you have to be aware of. And if you are using deprecated methods, stop using deprecated methods and use the suggested replacement instead. Um, so yes. Speaking of which, oh, one and a half minutes for tips for migration. I have written a whole article on this, so I'm going to skim through this quickly, and you can read the article in depth if that's more interesting to you. But the short version is, run it on the updated JDK. It might actually just work. I did this with a couple of open source projects. It just worked on Java 12. I didn't have to do anything. I was really surprised. I mean, of course, that's what I expected if Oracle's listening. It's totally fine. Um, so it might just work. If you have compiler warnings in your code as it stands on Java 8 right now, compiler warnings like deprecated methods, for example, do fix them and address them before thinking about upgrading. Because if it's deprecated, it's probably going to go away. And um, they're there for a reason. 
Update your dependencies. This is a good idea for security reasons anyway. Keep your dependencies up to date. I know it's difficult, especially if you're working on an application server, because sometimes it's, it's difficult to migrate those things up to the most recent version. But for security reasons, you should be keeping your dependencies up to date anyway. But you particularly need to um, update your dependencies and maybe add new ones for the bits of Java, the JDK, which are going away. You do need to update your build tool. The build tools, the older versions of Maven and Gradle are not going to work from Java with Java 9 or onwards. But the most recent versions of Maven and Gradle both work fine with Java 12. So upgrade your build tool, and it will probably take care of most of the problems anyway. And then you compile your application code against the JDK, and then finally start using the shiny new features. I know this is what we want to do first, but don't do this first. Do all the other stuff first, and then start doing this when everything's bedded in and it looks OK. In summary, Java is changing, and it's changing fast. We're getting releases every six months. We're getting new features dripped out to us. Modern Java can help you. It can make your code more readable, and it can definitely make things uh, more performance and more performant, and it can reduce cost and maintenance costs. There are two main upgrade options for you now going forwards. You can upgrade to Java 11, which is the long-term support release and should be supported by someone in some form for the next three years. Or you can upgrade to Java 12 and expect to upgrade every 12 months, every six months. You'll have to upgrade to Java 13 in September. I do suggest that we upgrade now and reduce future pain. The, the, the longer we leave it, the more pain we are going to have. As these methods start to go away, deprecation starts to be taken more seriously. I really think now is the time, now is the opportunity to move to at least 11. Um, and then keep upgrading. Once you've done the upgrade, keep upgrading every six months, at least in CI or some sort of test environment to make sure that you are on top of these changes. At this URL, you will see um, the slides, a video of this talk, and um, a further reading, a bunch of stuff about the features that I've covered, um, a, whole, a couple of articles about migrating that I just mentioned, um, and pretty much all the resources I used to, to actually learn how to put this talk together. Thank you very much.